after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to view the tomb. There was a violent earthquake because an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and approached the tomb. He rolled back the stone and was sitting on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing was as white as snow. The gods were so shaken by fear of him that they became like dead men. The angel told the woman, don't be afraid because I know you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. For he has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, he has risen from the dead, and indeed he is going ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there. Listen, I have told you. So, departing quickly from the tomb, with fear and great joy, they ran to tell his disciples the news. Just then, Jesus met them and said, Tobela. Right? Greetings! It's like a really joyful hello! Hi! They came up, took hold of his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus told them, Do not be afraid. Second time, go and tell my brothers to leave for Galilee, and they will see me there. This is the word of the Lord. Let me pray before we jump right in. Lord Jesus, we pray that you would illuminate your words to us this morning. We are thankful that we can open them amongst family. We are thankful for your Holy Spirit working inside of us as we read this age-old story and stand in awe of the truth of it once again. May your resurrection today bring us great joy a new vision for our lives and when we experience life and life in abundance. May we know that this is you who kept your promises while we taste the bread and the cup we just had reminded us of. We pray that your name be glorified. Speak to us, Holy Spirit. We are listening. We pray that in your name. Amen. There's something about the jacarandas blooming in Pretoria that is just absolutely magic. Now look, guys. I know that we are deep into autumn now, so just work with me. There's something about the end of September, beginning of October, when the jacarandas bloom. It's a sign of what is to come. And what is to come is... Summer. So when the jacarandas bloom, it's not summer yet, but you can sense that summer is on its way. Think about it. You venture out in some shorts, you maybe bust out your pair of Hawaiianas, you haven't worn in quite some time, you don't have to carry a jacket necessarily anymore, maybe just a little thin jersey will do. The mornings you kind of venture out, it's still cool-ish, but it's not that bad anymore. I don't know how many layers you guys put on once you get out of bed or how many you peel off when you go to bed. But like my worker stash is really, really, really thick. Like the moment I get out of bed, I go, perhaps your pants, socks I bought from Sanele, a jacket, then another jacket, and then maybe even a bee because it's cold, right, in Pretoria, in our house. My wife is laughing because she also has socks we bought from Sanele, and maybe some other people in the church too during lockdown. Okay. So winter, we know it's cold. Summer, we know it's hot and green and beautiful in Pretoria. And spring is this in-between time. And in spring, we literally feel that the winter is leaving us. There's certain things about winter we're not feeling anymore. We're not fully in summer yet, but we are starting to feel some of summer. So something new is on the way. Something different is here. You can feel it. Do you want to remember that slogan from the World Cup 2020? Uh, the 2010. Feel it, it is here. That's also our theme for today, for our Easter Sunday service. And here's the reason Jesus' death and resurrection is like the Jacarandas blooming in Pretoria. Think about it. Something has passed, and something is on its way. And you can sense it, you can feel it, and you can experience something of it already, even though it has not fully realized. Now for us as Christians, our faith hinges on these two events. That's why this is the holiday for us as Christians. It's the celebration. It's the biggest weekend in our church calendar. And we journeyed through this story this whole week. Oh, so sorry, this whole weekend, by the write-up we sent you. Just a quick plug on the side. If you used the write-up and 
may found it beneficial. Please give us some feedback. We would like to know if it was read and if people found it beneficial. Thank you, I got the shock emoji from Ben. Josie is also nodding, she sent me a message for that. And here's the reason. No cross and no resurrection means no Christian faith. Think of the descriptions we read at the start of every service when we say we are about three things and we say we are gospel-centered. We say a life-centered and saturated around the perfect birth, life, and then death, resurrection, ascension, and coming in Jesus Christ. Like if we take out death and resurrection, there's no gospel and there's no good news. That's why we have to give it some thought and spend a whole weekend on it. Here's our plan for today. A two-point sermon, not a three-point sermon. The two points. What exactly happened? Second point, what does it mean for us as followers of Jesus? Really, really simple. What exactly happened? And what does it mean for us as followers of Jesus? So we are going to have to consider the facts because this is a historical, factual account written down by someone as if it was the truth to convey a message to you so that you can place your faith in it and believe in it so that it can become true for you as well. It's not just a story that someone wrote hoping that their book will sell. This is biographical details of someone's life. So let's look at what exactly happened. It's important to see firstly that the event of the resurrection itself is not what is described by the evangelists. Right? The first evidence we get of the resurrection consists of the report from this angelic being, accompanied by the hard evidence that the tomb is empty. Okay? So it's the same as the Jacobandos. It, uh, it, it didn't describe how exactly the flower started opening and at which point in time could you see the flower. There's flowers. And that flower is the evidence that the summer is coming. Now, the empty tomb begins to awaken faith. Inside of us. It is really possible that Jesus is alive again because he's definitely not dead and he's definitely not in the tomb. And then the real proof of the resurrection is when you encounter the risen Christ. Do you guys see that? So I'm looking forward to summer because the Jacobandos are blooming. I'm starting to feel something of it, but when I actually get into summer in January and the sun rises early and it sets late, and it's beautifully warm in the day, and we have high cloud thunderstorms in the afternoon. That's when I know that the evidence I saw back then was true. So the evangelists don't describe line by line exactly how it happened, how Jesus took all the cloth off of his body, and what time of day he exited the tomb, how it all happened. The evangelists start with, the tomb is empty, so you ought to believe, and then I'm going to tell you a story of real people encountering the real risen so that's the first important thing we need to note of what exactly happened. Secondly, it was a scary and a earth-shaking event. The text says it left them like dead men. If you read the text in Greek, it pretty much has that cartoon feel of characters running and then they all just fall over. Okay? That is how scary this one was. So it was something that had a cosmic effect. It didn't happen quiet at some uh, remote place just outside the wall of Jerusalem. There was earth shaking and people being really, really scared. I don't know if we've got any Transformers fans in the house, right? I'm not necessarily a massive movie fan, but I love Transformers. And in the Transformers movie called The Revenge of the Fallen, one of the absolutely brilliant theme slash score songs was New Divide by Linkin Park, right? So I like Linkin Park, was a post-hardcore crew back in the day from my teens, really emotional music, lots of electric instruments, lots of noise, lots of uh, stuff going into their music. And uh, that song starts with an electric riff going ding, 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 and every time that riff starts in the movie, you go, something is going to happen now. Something is going to transform and blow up something else and then we'll go on to the next battle scene. Right? That's how the people must have felt like when the earth shook in that way. Is you knew that something is going down. You guys remember in the gospel account that we read on Friday, it was the Roman centurion, which was also a soldier of God, that said, in my words, oh snap, 
we made a mistake. Right? When the earth shook and there was ample evidence that something is going down, it was the Roman soldier who said, Oh, we made a great mistake. <laughs> he is actually the Son of God. Now remember, everyone else guarding Jesus' tomb knew what happened. So they put extra guards at the tomb. And now what happens? Do, 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 do. Oh no, we made another mistake. The earth was shaking again. I mean, it is a huge event that took place. <laughs> now, the focus of this narrative is on the proclamation that Jesus had been raised from the and it's got no temple. It's got no category. It's a story unlike anything else. That's why it says it as it is. It's a unique story in ancient literature. Remember in the Gospel of John, we had Lazarus who was dead, who was raised from the dead by Jesus. And then Jesus saying, I am the resurrection and the life. So that is also a unique story. It didn't have a template. There wasn't a narrative arc that people necessarily knew. But in ancient literature, Death always had the last word. Think about it. If you think of mythology, if you think of other religious texts in the ancient world, death proved that whoever killed was right and is more powerful. So even though you had many stories in the first century, uh, where many mentioned some of them, I think it was in your prayer, right? You said, um, it, it was in your prayer that you said that it was that this is a unique story and something unique to be celebrating. You pray that just now, didn't you? Like, I wasn't sleeping. It was you. It was real. Yes. Okay. So there was no category for this. This was a unique story. Because usually, in whatever story it is that was told in that time, once someone dies, they're really dead. And no one resurrects. Because the one that killed this one is the most powerful one, and then another one comes and kills this one again, and then he's the most powerful one, and that's how the mythologies and the stories gets involved. So death proved that whoever killed was right and was more powerful. And this story, it gets reversed, right? Death gets overcome. The person who died and were killed by someone else comes alive again and raises victorious. Okay. Now what's interesting about this specific story we have is that women became the first custodians of this message. And they became the first ones to proclaim that indeed Jesus has arisen. So the absent disciples who left Jesus at the end of his crucifixion must first rely on the testimony of women. Now that might not sound that odd for us, but in the first century that was really, really odd. Because in the first century women were not given the privilege of being witnesses to anyone. If you wanted to know the cold hard facts of what happened, you had to ask a man, and if the man had more standing than someone else, then his testimony would have been believed even more. So if this was a false story, if this was a story that was cooked up by someone, they definitely wouldn't have chosen women to be the first witnesses or the first custodians of it, right? Just a quick flashback to the birth story. You guys also realize that Jesus' birth story also had really unlikely witnesses. Shepherds. They smell like sheep. <laughs> they also couldn't testify in, uh, uh, I say in church. They, all, they all couldn't testify in court. They were people doing labor for someone else. And they were deemed to be lesser than some of the other people in their culture at that time. So isn't it just phenomenal how Jesus tips the scales or turns the things upside down in the sense that the first witnesses to his birth are very unlikely witnesses and the first witnesses to his resurrection are also very unlikely witnesses. And that fact, those facts, just doesn't change. It's just how it is. Shepherds in the beginning and women right at the end. So they were questionable in that sense. But our story starts with women, two maids, in verse 1. And they were given the responsibility to transfer this message. Okay. Now, the crowning events of the resurrection are the appearances of the risen Jesus, first to the women, and then to his disciples. So in these, 11, in these 10 verses we read, in, verses, in these 10 verses we read, 
Jesus appeared to the woman and he appeared to the disciples. And that's really where the, get, where the resurrection gets real. Because remember what I said, like you've got a sign, the jacarandas are blooming, and then you experience something. It's really when you experience something that you know that this sign pointed to what I hoped I would experience. They see an empty tomb, and then they see Jesus in the flesh, and they have an actual encounter with him. So the empty tomb, actually, even though it's very impressive and important, it's not sufficient evidence in itself for the resurrection of Jesus. What alone can be decisive for us and for the historical account is reliable eyewitness testimony that Jesus had been raised from the dead. And it says in the text uh, that he appeared to crowds. Paul recalls this in 1 Corinthians 15. He says he appeared to them 500 at a time. That is how many people bore witness to it. So back on the jacarandas, I know that I am riffing on them quite a lot this morning. But back to the jacarandas. Let's imagine that I'm uh, leaving our front door. We live right down here in Cornwall Street, in unit number 30 in Compass Hill, Hill Drive. Let's say I leave the front door and Lee comes up to me and she says, the jacarandas are blue. Right? It's a testimony. So someone gives witness to me and I need to now decide if I agree to believe it or not. I might believe it, or I might not. But then what happens is, as I uh, uh, cross the little hair veil turn, our neighbor on this side, Nishan, says, have you seen the jacarandas blue? And then as I'm opening up our garage, our neighbor on that side, Elad says, dude, have you seen the jacarandas? And then as I'm opening up our Runex, Tanya on that side says, dude, have you seen the jacarandas blue? Like, I wouldn't really be able to make a case that they're all lying. It's impossible, right? They all saw it. They all came driving in through a street that has jacarandas, and that is their witness. So if it was a singular witness, I might have scoffed at it and thought, maybe she just wasn't wearing her glasses. But the more people telling me, the more the anticipation in me starts growing, and I'm really excited to see the jacarandas. Now, why would people tell me about the jacarandas? Well, because they are also excited about it and they need to share their joy and their excitement of it. Do you guys see what the response was? The moment the woman saw Jesus. Look at verse 9. They took hold of his feet and they worshipped him. That's the appropriate response if you encounter the risen Christ. That's the excitement that comes with encountering him. They respond with worship. And here's why. They worshipped him, not so much because he had come back to life, even though that was an absolutely phenomenal thing to do, but because his resurrection vindicates all that he had said and done during his ministry. That's where the excitement lies, is he is right. He was right. Like, I, I used to believe him, but then they killed him, and then I didn't know what to do. Because should I believe him now, or should I not? Because someone else won, but now he came back to life, which means that he is right. Everything he said, everything he promised is right. His resurrection vindicates him. Guys, just a, just a quick glance at the Gospel of John. I am the bread of life. Yes, he is the bread of life. He said that if I eat him, I will never hunger again. He's right. I am the light of the world. They tried to kill the light. But they couldn't, and he still lives. I am the door for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. Yes, it is both of those things, because he's alive. I am the resurrection and the life. Nice one, absolutely proven to us, we can believe it. I am the way, the truth, and the life. That must have been, I think, on Holy Saturday, the biggest doubt in the minds of the disciples and everyone who followed him is, what do I do if he doesn't come back? Like, I know he said he will, but he was really dead. Like, really dead. And he's in the tomb. Like, there's two Marys that said they saw him, they saw them put him in the tomb. And those two Marys celebrated the whole Sabbath with us. And all of us were sitting there thinking, what if he doesn't come back from the dead? Like, who's the way then? What's the truth then? And where will I find life then? Jesus gets resurrected. Come on! Why, truth and life. 
replied, absolutely yes, that's what he said. And it vindicates that he was fine. I am the true vine. Stay in me and you will bear great fruit. Luckily he's alive, because now I can stay in. He's not an historical figure who said some awesome stuff that people wrote down. He is alive. So my notes write, yes, 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 yes. That's how they must have felt. Now look, I wouldn't freak out like that because of the Jacob Hopkins. Maybe one year. Oh, my suffering is on the way. But like if you put all your chips on someone's teaching, if you believe that someone could save you, if you had a meal with someone who broke bread and who poured wine and said, I will cover all your sin and I will take all the punishment for you and I'm creating a new covenant with you and he dies and he comes back. That is a massive, massive yes. And I think it feels like fear and terror at the same time. You guys see it? That's why I asked the question in question of the day. Just that overwhelming feeling that comes to the fore in our worship of Jesus. That's how we feel when we encounter him as alive indeed. Just for, in case you were wondering what my answer to the question of the day was, it was most definitely the birth of our first child. And here's the reason. Because while the kid, well, Ava, while Ava was in Marie's stomach, she was good. Like, we didn't have to give her anything. She was really, really solid. So all of our, uh, you know, ideas and dreams about raising this child was so theoretic, you know. And then when Ava was born, I went, oh, we can't put her back. Like, she's here now. Oh, the boy is gone. I don't know how to be a dad. I'm not prepared at all. So I look like this. <laughs> Did you guys see it? It's like a crying, laughing face. That's how they found it. This is what happened when people saw Jesus baptized. So that's the first point. My word, I went way longer than I wanted to. That is what happened. And we believe this to be true. The first song we sang, can you feel it? Do you believe it? That is a, such an important question that all of us have to answer. Because if you don't feel it, you can still believe it. But if you don't believe it, you will not find life. You will not put all your chips on it. You will not trust in the resurrection. We have to believe this. That's why we take time on Easter Sunday for us uh, to think through this again and to have it work in our hearts. Okay, second point. What does it mean for us as followers of Jesus? Like, what's the implications of summer that is coming? Ad break. Next up on Fellowship City, we will be starting a new series. Here's the series name. The Resurrection and Your Life. Okay, so for the next five weeks, we are going to only chat about the resurrection and your life, which means that I am going to glance over them now as a nice little preview, and then we can get into the depths of it uh, from next week onwards. What does it mean for us as followers of Jesus? Let me just run through them really quickly. I would like you to take a look at these binoculars on the screen. It gives us a new vision for life. Example, think of Luke 24, the really well-known chapter Two people on their way home, on their way home to Emmaus. Jesus joining them on the road, having a conversation with them. According to those two people, we look at them in depth next week. What happened in Jerusalem was really, really sad. Like it was a fail. It was a loss, according to them. It wasn't what they expected. Jesus is dead. It seemed like everything that had to come after that, everything he promised, was all done. It seemed like either the Jewish council and the Roman rulers won on the day. They were really, really gutted. Jesus joins them on the road. He takes them through the story again. The prophets and the law. And then they go, oh, snap! Okay, now we see all of this in a whole new light. Now we, are, we have a different understanding of the world. We have a different understanding of our emotions. We have a different understanding of what's going on. I see it differently than I used to. That's what the resurrection brings forth in our lives as believers. So there's one thing. We'll tackle that next week. We have hope. Listen to the Apostle Peter. This is also our benediction later. 
Because Jesus was raised from the dead, this is 1 Peter 1, verses 3 to 5, we've been given a brand new life and have everything to live for, including a future in heaven, and the future starts now. Regardless of our circumstances, we see things differently and we have hope. Why? Because of the resurrection. Because the most hopeless, dead thing one could ever witness turned into the most awesome, restorative process of new life and new possibilities by Jesus himself. So we look at the world differently. We have hope regardless of our circumstances. We read Romans chapter 8 a couple of weeks ago when we were still in our I Am Who I Am series. And I spoke about the spirit suffering in prayer in which Paul says that us as human beings and creation, this place we live in, all long for something new. And we groan and creation groans. And we want to be liberated and creation should be liberated. And it will happen one day. Why? Because of the resurrection. Because death does not have the final word. The resurrection reverses the cycle and it creates something new and it is in being at the moment and it will come to its full realization or fruition in the end. So not only do we see everything differently, not only do we have a hope that cannot be taken away or broken, we also hope for the restoration of the dead. I mean, I didn't plan on saying this, but let me just take a quick second. I don't know how broken your heart is about the flooding that's going on in Kwazulu-Natal at the moment. I'm really having a hard time reading the news reports, seeing the images, and watching the videos. Because it's, for me personally, it's more than flooding that is going on, right? It's the earth reacting and not being in a great space, and us being to steward this earth and live on it, really suffering through it. And you see people dying, losing everything they have, we praise God for rain, and then it floods. There's, there's so much, like, complicated stuff around it. And then I look at the news and I go, this will all change. This will change. Creation will be liberated. It will be made new. It will be restored back to what it was. This is only momentary. It breaks my heart to see it, but it would not last forever. It cannot. Because otherwise God wouldn't be true to His Word. And He is true to His Word because He was resurrected from the dead. Think about our present lives. Paul talks in 1 Corinthians 15 of a continuity and a discontinuity. I know that, that might sound like big words. Let me break it down. Paul says that some of the things we have now, are now, and do now will continue into eternity. And some of the things we have now, do now, uh, uh, what else? Have now and do now. And? And are now will discontinue and it won't last forever. So, as an example, he uses our bodies. He says, You have a body now, but that body is made of flesh. We need a different body to last for eternity. So, there will be a discontinuation in our bodies. It will be go from, from fleshly to spiritual, but I'll still be lying. Right? So, like a bee, you've got a plant that starts as a seed, and then you see it as a growing plant with nice core on the calm. It's both mealy. They just look a little bit different. You get me? That's actually the uh, example Paul uses in 1 Corinthians 15 somewhere. So Paul says the present matters and the present echoes into eternity. Like what we do now actually matters. And then in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 58 he says our work actually matters. Like he says to the Corinthians don't think that your work is just a useless or futile exercise you'll do in your earthly existence. What we do now, how we create order out of chaos in doing our work will have a lasting effect on eternity. That's one of the things that the resurrection means for us. Is that we have a, a, a time frame that we live in called eternity. And our present matters in light of that. Last thing, all things will be made new. Why? Because of the resurrection. And that's really, really important. In Revelation chapter 21 to 22, we have this series of poems written by John. And these poems show how the new creation will look, what will be similar to our current creation, and what will be dissimilar to the world. 
And it explains this beautiful amalgamation or coming together of God's space and human space in perfect unity with, uh, um, uh, with each other once again. If I could just have the next slide, please, Rudolf. I mean, this isn't probably the most prettiest photo you've ever seen in your life, but it is a ripper. It is a ripper. Just take a look at it. There's so much beauty in this photo. Now, I'm not saying that this is a Revelation chapter 21 and 22. Let's be honest. There's more to it, but it is extraordinary. And John says, because death was defeated, and because the resurrection started this redemption and renewal cycle, and because Jesus is alive, chose to give his spirit to his people, empowers his church to share the good news, and to establish his kingdom on earth, we are moving towards that. I know it doesn't look like it. If I flip open News 24 now and I browse through top stories, that is not going to be what I'm seeing. But the Bible says that is where we are headed. Why? Because Jesus is alive. You guys know that song from, I think it's Shalem, old school hip hop song, right? It's because Jesus is alive. We know that this is where we are headed. Jesus is alive. The tomb is empty. I'm going to finish off my sermon with the theme I started with, and that is fear. It is here. Lord Jesus, when we speak to you, it's so awesome and encouraging and life giving to know that you are alive. We know it, we believe it, we've heard it, we've seen the evidence, and we have encountered you. Thank you that you were raised from the dead. Thank you for the eyewitness accounts that we can read once again today and celebrate accordingly. Thank you for your love and thank you for everything that the resurrection means for us. I pray that today we would not leave here not transformed by this good news, but that we would even start feeling today how the resurrection has a bearing in our lives. May we see things differently. May we have hope. May we believe that the broken creation we currently see will be restored into something May we know that our present lives matter. May we look forward to the day that you will be in your story. We love you, Lord Jesus. We are thankful.